We're going to start by talking about celebrity. What is it? How to get it? How to use it? And how to keep it? Andy Warhol once said, in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Now, the, the, the quips attributed to Walt Warhol, even though there's some dispute as to whether or not he coined it, it was on a program of a show of his, uh, an exhibition in 1968 out in Sweden. It gained tremendous cultural resonance in the 70s and 80s. I mean, we've all heard the quote. It's a good quote. And the quote, and a lot of Warhol's work resonates with a view that celebrity is something that's becoming mass produced, manufactured, cheap. Often there's discussions about celebrity and you see people say, oh, there are so many people who are famous for being famous or famous for nothing. And a lot of people see this new breed of celebrity and the attention we pay to them. And they take it as a sign of dysfunction in society. It's the, or, you know, a, a decline in our character or something that, that is otherwise not great. Now, Warhol's observation was made a, 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 and the traction that the quote gained what happened in a very specific historical context. And it was a period in which mass communications technology was evolving in ways that made new forms of communication possible and new cultural production enterprises more viable. In the 70s and 80s, there was a shift towards uh, uh, mass communications media that allowed people to um, uh, consume programming on a personal level, like without other people. There were more televisions. The Walkman came out, car radios and cassette players, uh, uh, portable audio like boom boxes. Uh, and so one change that occurred in the 70s and 80s was uh, broadcast consumption or media consumption. A lot of it moved out of the family room and into people's personal spaces. And that allowed for new forms of consumption, right? Uh, it might be that the whole family doesn't want to watch an episode of Jackass on MTV or the whole family doesn't want to listen to a, a shock jock, you know, or consume pornography. But when personalized consumption was more viable, those types of products gained traction. Another change that happened was that there were new media developing that circumvented both legal and informal regulations of culture. So for example, cable TV and satellite TV allowed adult programming to be broadcast on TV, whereas that wasn't allowed on broadcast TV uh, over the airwaves. Uh, video cassettes uh, and cassette tapes. Cassette tapes enabled uh, new forms of music to be distributed. Music that wouldn't be sold or carried by a record label, but was easy enough for people to develop grassroots markets for. So the point that I'm, and, and, and what happened here was these new media created new cultural outlets and new forms of culture. And when people looked at them, they were different from what they had seen before. And some of people were left asking, what is this garbage? What is this pornography on television? You know, what's this rap music? Who's this idiot on, on, on FM radio? Why is this popular? And, and at the time, there were a lot of debates about censorship. Fast forward 20 years, and our era is like that on steroids. Whatever communication affordances were created by things like cable TV or cassette tapes is now, uh, it, it's, it, it, you know, it's exponentially larger over the internet. The internet is created like an almost unlimited pipeline of content, and it's almost impossible to uh, regulate. And technology has evolved so that people with next to no technical knowledge or, or specialty equipment or money can set up uh, broadcast outlets that command audiences that are the size of what commercial audiences drew uh, in past eras. Like for example, at our peak uh, uh, on my podcast, we were getting about 1200 listeners a week for a one hour program. That's, that's like a, a drive home audience in a, for a radio station in a mid-sized city. Like it's one person on a shoestring budget bringing in audiences that used to be commanded by media enterprises. And so what's happened is all sorts of new content has become available. And all of us have 
uh, or, or media audiences have fragmented. We're now, whereas once we might have all watched the same set of shows or listened to the same announcers, watched the same news, now our media diets are becoming more individuated. Right? We have a distinct media diet, even from the people we live with and our close friends. We follow different Facebook groups. We follow different people on Twitter. We like different YouTube videos. We, you know, tune into different blogs. And that process where everybody's tuning into a different mix of uh, producers is called audience fragmentation. So what's happened is there's a lot more content, a lot more media outlets, and we're dividing our attention between it. And so what happens is there is now a much larger universe of small scale celebrities who are delivering content that was once unconventional. And so the, the Andy Warhol observation of, uh, of just fame looking cheap or mass produced or easy because we're seeing so much of it, it's now much more like that. And it's an interesting, th this development is interesting in a lot of ways. It gives us a space for pro uh, probing concepts of fame and celebrity, seeing how they've changed, making note of this new environment and, and, and thinking through the concepts. All right. So let's start off with some basic concepts. First, what's fame? Who are celebrities? Now, if you look at the etymology of these words, you find that they're rooted in 13th century, 14th century Latin terms, denoting reputation or public opinion. And that meaning is carried over into the literature on the topic. If you read up on fame, it's used in general to denote a person who is known by strangers, or fame itself is renowned by strangers. It happens when people who you don't know, they recognize you. They know they have information of you. They might have feelings or opinions of you. They're relating to you as a person, uh, even though they don't know you personally. And when one person knows many people like that, they have fame. And a person who possesses fame is celebrity. Now, uh, fame can occur on different levels. There are people who are very, very famous you know, like Tom Hanks or the president of the United States. But fame can go down to local levels where, for example, people in a small town know the local weatherman or even people in New York City know who the weatherman is on New York One. And it even happens, for example, a microcosm of that happens on college campuses where a lot of students might know a large lecture professor, right? And it's a situation where there's that asymmetry. One, one per or uh, many people know one person. One person is known to many people. Now, on the surface, this might strike you as obvious or an uninformative definition, but conceptualizing it of this way has a lot of benefits. One is uh, it allows you to recognize fame that doesn't resonate with you personally, because one of the problems in studying fame is that fame is our sense of fame is highly personalized. Uh, and as researchers, we need objective standards. Um, there is a tendency, or, or, uh, you know what, I'll get to it. Let me move forward and I'll, I'll get to it. So one way to probe what's meant by a concept is to look at how researchers measure it. And the way it, celebrity has been measured uh, in, in, in has evolved over recent decades, but there's still a common core, common meaning that's being captured. Now, before the internet, uh, usually uh, people used uh, sales data as a, a proxy for fame. So for example, if Will Smith were to star in a movie, they'd see what Will Smith, whether a Will Smith movie drew a lot. And if Will Smith's movies draw a lot, they infer that he's a star. Now that happened with smaller and medium-sized media uh, enterprises in particular, because uh, sales data, they had to collect it for accounting purposes. But back in the day, a lot of the more detailed knowledge that big enterprises had was developed using social scientific research methods, just like the kind we teach here at Queens College. And in fact, a lot of media research has its roots in sociology uh, through work, especially by Paul Lazarsfeld, um, is well known in that era, and they did what we do. They ran focus groups, they ran surveys, and they would uh, find ways to quantify celebrity. And here's an example of that on the screen. This is called a Q score. It's still being put out. And what it is, is it's made by running surveys 
and asking panels of respondents to rate whether or not they recognize a celebrity and how they feel about celebrities. And this is Q scores from uh, 2017. It's for uh, national morning TV anchors. So as you see here, uh, recognizability, like we said, uh, part of celebrities just being known to their people. And you can see there are, are morning announcers like Kathy Lee Gifford or Al Roker, uh, you know, George Stephanopoulos, who are very widely known. And then there's uh, affect, like a positive Q score. This is how much people like the celebrity. So people like Kathy Lee Gifford might be well liked or widely known, but not well liked. Whereas uh, people might not know Robert, well, Robin Roberts is well known, but people who know Sam Champion or Josh Elliott seem to like him. Now, with the internet, our ability to measure fame has grown uh, considerably. We're, we were able to move from self-reports to behavioral data, rather than asking people who they like, asking people if they paid attention to a uh, celebrity, we could just see who they surfed for. We could see, you know, who they followed on Facebook, you know, where they clicked. Uh, and so what's happened is it, we've built a much more enriched capacity for quantifying fame. And there's a lot of efforts going on to, to find ways to uh, put better numbers on celebrities. And it's also created a lot of uh, knowledge in the celebrity space. They know that. And now there's a lot, there's a lot of efforts to game that system, either by purchasing followers, uh, hiring algorithms to make it look like more people share your stories or click on your links and things like that. Now, even though the methods have changed, there's still the same basic insight that they're getting at. How much, how widely someone is known, what do people know of them, and how do people feel about them? So times have changed, the methods we use to measure it have changed, but it, it has a timeless core, no, renowned to strangers and the feelings associated with it. Now, if you're a fan of morning TV, you might have been surprised to see how low some of the name recognition is uh, among uh, well-known TV celebrities, right? You might be surprised that not a lot of people know who, uh, you, you know, uh, George Stephanopoulos is. Uh, we in sociology might be really surprised to hear that, you know, nobody knows who Robert Merton is outside of our discipline. And part of it is that Fame exists in a field. It's like a sphere of discourse, a sphere of attention uh, where a person is relevant. So fame exists where people pay attention to the area of discussion or action where the celebrity is relevant. And people who don't pay attention to that, the celebrity might as well be anybody else. Their fame is not fungible. It doesn't have an impact. So for example, if you're a baseball fan, you know who Mike Trout is. You might want Mike Trout to meet your child or grandchild. You might invite Mike Trout, you know, to speak to the community. But if you don't know who Mike Trout is, well, then Mike Trout might as well be Salman Ken or uh, Dil Rabbi, uh, Dilmarat, who are two far, far bigger stars who I'm guessing most of you have never heard of because they operate in a space that where your attention doesn't gravitate. And even though you know, for example, that Salman Khan is very famous, because I've told you so, you might not be moved emotionally because like, you know, it, it's not meaningful to you. You're not, uh, you're, you're not invested in the space where Salman Khan does work. And so his celebrity isn't, 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 uh, is it, it, it doesn't have an impact on you. But where you do pay attention to the field, if you do know baseball, then you're more likely to know of Mike Trout, click on an ad listen to his opinion, and all that. Um, all right. All right. Now, what has happened with this fragmentation of us all getting uh, paying attention to smaller audiences is there's uh, been a, a new breed of what are called micro celebrities. So whereas a lot of uh, a, a lot of our celebrities might have been followed by very large audiences, 
a lot of people who are celebrities today are in the celebrity business. I'll explain what that is in a second. They often cater to small audiences in the tens of thousands. And, and uh, like sociology is included in that. Our most famous people are playing to audiences of tens of thousands. And in that sense, they're micro celebrities, just like all the niche podcasters that Ryan and I have been uh, interviewing. Um, but still, there is something interesting in talking to these podcasters, and uh, there's something to be learned about it. One more thing I want to say before I move on from this is that uh, a celebrity's attachment to a field often binds their fates together, the, the fate of the field and the fate of the celebrity. So, for example, Fauci was very well known in communicable disease circles before COVID, but it took COVID to put him on the cover of Time to be a household name, to be on Good Morning America. So Fauci's field rose and he did. And it can happen in, in the opposite, right? Like I think of like Waif, uh, Kate Moss. Right? Remember those Waif models who looked like they were sickly thin? That was a subsector of the fashion industry when it lost cultural cachet, the practitioners in that space lost their cachet. Now, this tie creates an incentive for people to boost the fields that are the basis of their fame, but it can also create an incentive for someone to separate from their field, use their early fame as a springboard to fame in another space with better prospects for them personally or a, fame, a field that has a, a more lasting power. So think of, for example, how George Foreman went from being a boxer to selling a grilled chicken, like a TV pitchman. Or for younger people, how Jake Paul, after Vine closed, he got onto YouTube and now he's uh, trying his hand at, at, at boxing and other spectacle matches, right? When the field dies, you can move to another one, but there is some type of binding between a celebrity and their field. So let's talk about becoming famous, which is what a lot of young people want to know. It's, and, and it's an interesting question. How do people become famous? Now, it's easy to find surface explanations for specific cases, right? We could say, oh, this actor became famous after this breakthrough role, or uh, this singer became famous after this hit song. But developing general explanations of how to become famous we, requires us to have some sense of like the underlying mechanism and, uh, 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 and, and a sense of what fame is. Uh, you know, beyond renown, but like how it works, where does human attention draw generically? Now, the literature offers a lot of explanations as to why people acquire fame. And each of them sensitizes us to a factor and suggests practical ideas of how a podcaster could acquire fame, but they all have their limits. So I, I want to go through five, uh, five, uh, prevalent explanations in literature, and then talk about the enterprise management view that came through in uh, uh, my work with Ryan, and is the uh, it's the uh, the take that we're I think we're approaching with. The first explanation of fame is probably the most common, and it's that famous people become famous for doing impressive things or for being special or outstanding. So, you know. Uh, John Sullenberger, Sully was famous for landing a plane in the Hudson River and saving everybody's life. Now, you know, that's a, that's, that's a pretty great accomplishment. Uh, and so he's famous. Or Wayne Gretzky was a great hockey player. Or Jeff Bezos made a lot of money. And these types of dynamics can occur at lower levels of aggregation too, right? Like local celebrities who are stars in the local music scene or you know, the anchor for local TV or the captain of the football team. My daughters uh, know the teenager who won the local singing contest. And I remember they uh, asked me to, you know, walk up and introduce myself as if they were real celebrities. To my daughters, they were celebrities. Um, let's just think about this. Okay, I'll get back to that. Now, the idea that fame is acquired by achievement suggests that to become famous, you got to do something great. You got to attain excellence in some field. And, and, and that is often how people rise to fame. That's, you know, we know of Michael Phelps because he won the gold medals. You know, we know of JK Rawlings either because we like the story. We know she sold billions of dollars of books. Um, usually the, the, the main issue with this explanation is that achievement can exist in the eye of the beholder. Like for example, 
Charles Manson is very famous. You know, Ted Bundy is famous. There's a whole genre of culture that celebrates mass murderers. And I guess you could say, well, he killed a lot of people. That's an accomplishment in the field of murder. But like, it also speaks to the fact that you can construe anything as an achievement or an impressive feat, you know, including antisocial things or even trivial things. And so it's hard to use achievement as a basis for explaining how fame works in general. Because you can always find something to be like, oh, they're great at that. Oh, they're great at facial expressions. You know. The second view emphasizes status and sees our relationship intertwined with our social position. So for non-sociologists, uh, the, the concept of status, as I use it here, talks about people's natural proclivity to uh, fall into pecking orders or, or deferential behavior. Whenever you have a, a sufficiently large group of people, it's sort of, a, it, it's an observed behavior of people that they will organize in authority structures, informal ones. Everybody will start, somebody will become the boss and everybody will start listening to the boss. Or two or three people will be loud and dominant and then everybody's going to listen to them. All right. Now, that's an informal status hierarchy, and it develops naturally. And then we have formal ones, like who becomes the president of the, 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 the country or the school. So in this way, uh, fame is a lot like high school popularity, right? People are famous, in, you know, if they're well-known, if, if people think that they're popular or important in their social world. Now, the implication here is that you can acquire fame by securing a position of power uh, or status in a community and use that as a basis to acquire fame. So, for example, we listen to Frank Wu. He's the president of our college. He's famous in our college. He's important in our college. It makes sense that we would pay attention to what he says because he's the boss. You know, he has a high status in the social system that we're embedded in. And so we pay attention to him just as we pay attention to whoever the president is now. Now, when there's turnover and somebody loses that status, often we do stop paying attention to them. We stop paying attention to the past presidents of our country or of our school, right? We don't listen. We, we might not pay attention to uh, people who are in former positions. Now, there's merit to this view. Fame can accrue to high status people. That much we know. When somebody becomes a CEO or a big shot, we do pay attention to them. And fame can confer status, like we might respect somebody or defer to them because we know they're famous or popular. But it is not necessarily a great explanation, or it doesn't give us a great guide for how somebody low status can acquire fame. And we know that happens, right? We know it happens all the time. Most people who are famous did not walk into that position. It was built. And so how? So that's the limit of it. It's interesting. It sensitizes us to the idea that Fame relationships can be in a status hierarchy, but it does uh, not give us a lot of explanation as to how. Hype is a third path to fame. The uh, idea with hype is that uh, you spread information about somebody, tell everybody about something, either through advertisements or public relations, publicity. Uh, the limit of this is hype promotion can be an important part of a strategy to acquire fame, but there are many instances in which somebody is hyped and audiences don't take to the person. So, uh, and the person's celebrity doesn't exist beyond the hype, beyond somebody paying for their exposure. So hype can generate exposures, but it can't guarantee that someone will attach or engage with a person and become a celebrity, follow them. The fourth is charisma. Uh, it's rooted in the Greek words for charm and beauty. And what this is, this is like the Max Weber concession. Hold on. Conception of, uh, you know, uh, having a, 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 an indefinable an draw, an indefinable uh, uh, allure. Uh, charisma can involve appearances, you know, like John Hamm is a very, very handsome man. But it's more than that. A lot of charismatic people are able to transmit a magnetic quality. A charisma is like a, something that draws people to them. And it can be in their character. It can be in their manner, their way of speaking. It doesn't have to be in their appearance. Uh, 
Now, there's a lot of research on what makes somebody charismatic in the field of leadership studies. And there's a general agreement that the literature hasn't really gone far past laundry lists of things like, you know, aggressive, attractive, intelligent, and so on. There's no, the, the literature that I've seen hasn't developed like a real uh, defined sense of what charisma is, how it's generated, how it affects people, but rather it's treated like a residual category. Oh, this person's loved, therefore they have charisma. Now let's find out what the essence of that charisma is. So sometimes it's not a meaningful guide. The last one is an interest, or the, the last one in the literature is an interesting one. And it's the view of celebrities as a symbol. And it comes from Jeff Alexander. And the idea here is that celebrities or famous people we use as stand-ins to uh, represent institutions or organizations or ideals or movements or communities. So for example, the idea would be like when we celebrate Marx, we're not actually celebrating Marx. Uh, we might be celebrating, uh, you know, socialist ideals or anti-capitalist sentiment, or we might, you know, identify with intellectualism. You know, there is... The celebrities, the people we follow as celebrities, they, they, they might be sort of uh, personifications of abstract things. And we interact with the people as if, as if they're who we're communing with, but we're using them as a means of affirming our fidelity or, you know, our, our adherence to an identity or an ideal or something like that. Um. And then finally, this is the view that is coming through in our research, I think. And Ryan, maybe you'll disagree with me. Uh, uh, Ryan's looked at the empirical work. He's not really working on this paper. He's working on something else. But I find that when we talk to the micro celebrities, uh, they look to us like person-centered mass communications enterprises. By a mass communications enterprise, I mean it's like a project or an organization that's focused on disseminating content or information. It's person-centered. So the enterprise is branded by an individual identity as opposed to an abstract one. So instead of Vox Media, it's Ezra Klein, right? Instead of, you know, uh, Happy Madison Productions, it's Adam Sandler. Um, there is often, for larger celebrities and smaller ones, there's often multiple people who are working to create that single image. It's a full enterprise. Like for Jennifer Lopez, for example, she has, a, uh, she has tons of employees, all of whom play a role in creating Jennifer Lopez as we recognize her in popular culture. There's publicists, personal trainers, assistants, and they're working on things like physical appearance or her performance and things like that. That's a whole team. That's an organization. Like if you look at the flow of work, and the people involved, it looks like an organization. Uh, and so one way that I've come to see celebrity is it's like a person branded enterprise. And I get this sense, you can get this sense when you talk to people in a lot of ways. One is when we talk to respondents, there's a detachment from fame. It's not something like you expect to be, oh, I love fame, but usually they have sort of a cynical view of it. They're like, yeah, it's part of the job. We need followers, but I, uh, my sense was, I, is that I didn't really, I don't recall meeting respondents who were like, oh, I love fame. I love the love that I get. They express a, an appreciation for being followed, an appreciation for people who consume their products and a desire to serve them and, and satisfy them as, as any business would, it's customer base, but the personal attachment at least struck me as not being there. We talked about how there's multiple people involved and that happens even with micro celebrities. You know, they have subcontractors working on aspects of their communication, like a website, you know, or, or their social media. So we've been in organizations that hire writers. We've uh, There's one that I can think of that hired writers. So what came out of the person's mouth wasn't their own speech. They hired somebody. Fame is generally not a means, but or it's often a means, but not an end. I think that's self-explanatory. And more importantly, when we look at how fame is built, it looks a lot like a business. 
uh, you know, they have a target market in mind. They're aware of where they are. They try to create products that satisfy them, build a fidelity, a, a loyal following. And they're always trying to sell and promote their franchise to audiences. So the way that the micro celebrities that we've observed strike me is they, they look like entrepreneurs and they seem to talk about their work as if they were entrepreneurs, even when they're the product. Like there's some separation. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to say? You want to disagree or anything like that? Or uh, no, I, I think you know I, I, we've talked about this. I agree with a lot of what you're saying, of course. And I think the one other thing I would add, I think maybe you're going to get to this. I don't know, is that the the technology. You know, what's different about the celebrity today is that a lot of the people we spoke to, they were kind of cultivating relationships with their communities, right? Yeah. Which is very different than movie stars of the past that were just on the silver screen and you had no contact with. These celebrities were able to uh, communicate directly with them, you know, have, have them as Patreons supporting them. Uh, it's a very more kind of relational uh, experience as a celebrity. And I think that that's partly why they didn't want to be grand celebrities for the whole world. They really just wanted status within their uh, communities there. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Oh, because that's totally I thought you were going to get to it. Yeah, totally, to totally. <laughs> it's good. All right. Let's talk about uses of fame. I'm going to be really quick because I realize I'm running out of time and I want to have a lot of time for discussion. How do people use fame? Um, there are four types of discussions about how fame is deployed that we've come across or that have come up in our discussions. Um. The first are psychic rewards. So uh, I think a lot of aspiring celebrities uh, think about uh, the, as they're young people, they think about esteem, impressing their friends, getting the love of strangers, feeling wanted and things like that. And the micro celebrities who we interview, they, they appreciate, they do feel esteem. They are flattered that people follow them. They are very grateful, but like I said, it, that I don't know. It 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 it's, it feels very much like they are that the investment is lower than you might expect. Uh, they do enjoy fame if it's part of an activity that they enjoy or that's a creative outlet. Uh, and for some people, fame can be a mixed blessing. I had a discussion. First of all, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, earlier this week, I did a podcast with Carrie Ferris, who's one of sociology's leading sociologists of fame. And she said in her work, you know, a lot of female news anchors, for example, they get harassed. They don't like it. They have people come up to them at dinner, you know, when they're at a restaurant to interrupt. And it's unpleasant or it makes you feel unsafe. And so Renown can be a mixed blessing. And for some people, it's just like it's a fact of life that they have to deal with, given the type of work they do. They're in a communication centric line of work. And this is like the price you have to pay. It's not unlike, for example, what a professor might feel like if somebody interrupts their dinner, you know, in the cafeteria while they're having friends, if they were to get a steady stream of that. You're grateful, you're accessible, you know, but it can be too much. There, there are instances where it can be too much and even threatening. The second reason is money. And my sense is that fame is not easy to monetize. Monetize is the word that they use, converting fame into money. And it's really quite difficult. And even people who are uh, quite famous, they generally they've reported, you know, modest, modest incomes. A lot of them have, a lot of people who I thought were quite famous had day jobs um, or they had other sources of income. Fame in and of itself, even when you're well known, uh, might not uh, lend itself to making much money unless you're extremely famous. And often it's a subordinate uh, motive anyways. Like we, I, I think there are many creators, they know how they could become more popular. Uh, there are ways that you could easily create uh, an enterprise that is more popular by doing something controversial or taking up topics that are, you know, taboo or whatever. But like people don't want to uh, because fame is often not the main goal. 
What is valuable to a lot of our respondents is status and group membership. Uh, there are some creators who are a lot like academics. You know how academics, they love sociology. They want to build sociology. They want to meet other sociologists. They want to become respected in the field of sociology. So that those type of dynamics occur in a lot of areas of interest, from comic books to like vacation, theme park, you know, timeshare, whatnot. Like there's all sorts. And we've run into creators who look a lot like professors on, you know, esoteric subjects that don't fit neatly into, uh, into uh, you know, an academic discipline. But they're still very serious about it. And a lot of those dynamics exist. The last thing that celebrity is uh, thought to be useful for is influence. And um, celebrity can give you the power of, of exposure. It gives you the power to deliver a message to someone. But research into celebrity endorsers shows that it's more complicated than that. Audiences evaluate celebrities as if they were like they do other people in their lives. They evaluate how much they trust a celebrity, how competent they think a celebrity is to comment or make an appraisal of an object that they're speaking about. And they'll listen to them as they would any other person in their life. So for example, if Tom Hanks says, you know, go get your COVID vaccine, there are people who might reject, you know, not everybody will listen to Tom Hanks, even if they like him. They might say, well, Tom Hanks has different politics from me, or Tom Hanks is not a medical professional. So people are thoughtful in how they evaluate, uh, uh, how they evaluate uh, the influence of celebrities. Let's see. Uh, all right. Finally, last topic, and then we'll open it up to discussion. It's going to make a good time. Let's take a moment to talk about the death of celebrity and cancellation. Now, George Patton famously said, all glory is fleeting. And it is because fame decays as soon as it's secured. Uh, you will find that, or, or I, I think my sense of our interactions with our respondents and my experience in running podcasts is that keeping the attention of somebody, keeping access to people's informational diets is a constant job. You uh, people lose interest in you as soon as they stop getting rewards for following you, for engaging with you. And so staying relevant is a task that somebody is always having to do or else fame will naturally decay. Why does fame decay? There's a lot of views on that. First is it is believed that uh, uh, human attention draws to novelty. And so the first time you see something, you pay attention to it, it's noteworthy. But the more you see something, the less you pay attention to it. And that can work with people as well. Sometimes contextual changes affect the relevance of the field. So Fauci is famous during COVID. At the end of COVID, will as many people be interested in Fauci? Probably not, because the relevance of the field has declined, right? And often when somebody breaks through and becomes famous, it's because the salience of their field is peaking and there's somebody important in it. Like it's sort of at a local maximum of public interest in what they do is when you'll break out. But as soon as you do, it's already declining. New cycles turn, new, you know, new topics come up. And even though audiences might like someone, they become less relevant, they spend less time and they forget. Celebrities can also lose influence or impact in a field like an aging athlete somebody who loses their position. And there's also just interference of new data. So uh, cognitive researchers say that we forget because every new piece of information that we receive uh, interferes with the recall of old stuff. And so just by going through your day and seeing things, it's going to push the per what you watched last night on TV and the person who was featured in it out of your cognition from your, you know, the forefront of your mind to the deep recesses of your memory. Now, how can you slow the fade? How can people stay relevant? Well, often people try to refresh their fame by doing something new or different. But if you're not doing something new and if you're not moving to a new field, then uh, one way that 
the fade can be slowed is by something that Candy and colleagues uh, uh, call uh, 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 cultural encoding. So what happens is there are two uh, two stages in a, per, a, a celebrity's descent into obscurity. There is first the fall from active engagement. So right now we actively engage with Fauci because he's an important figure in government and has expertise on an important issue that is concerning us now. And so we will pay attention to Fauci now. That's active engagement. As COVID becomes less relevant, politically or to you personally, you're just going to stop paying attention. And that's the first fall. But you will still remember Fauci. There'll still be talk of Fauci. You'll watch, you know, CNN's uh, Remember COVID special, and it'll have Fauci in it. But over time, everything related to Fauci falls from memory. The people who remember Fauci die off, and people fall into obscurity, unless you have like an institution that's constantly bringing you back. You know, like the like the church brings back Jesus, right? Or like you know, uh, the federal government brings back memories of all of our old presidents. So one way to culturally encode what happens is while you're popular, if you can be inserted into other pieces of information or cultural objects, then those objects' persistence might carry you uh might might keep your celebrity alive for a little longer so for example uh john sullenberger landed the plane in the hudson and and he was very very famous for a few weeks a few news cycles but then tom hanks made a movie about him he encoded the story of sullenberger into a hollywood film and that pulls out sullenberger's notability for several more years right we don't forget about them in part because there's a movie that movie's in on a Netflix catalog. Some, you know, it's available, uh, you know, in a, in a, at a rental. Well, there's no more rental stores, but you can buy it on iTunes or whatever. So the existence of the movie encodes Sullenberger's presence in the culture. And the more somebody's encoded, the more stuff that's made about them, the longer they stay. But eventually everybody gets forgotten. One thing that, uh, we found in, 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 in our work also is uh, that, that isn't mentioned in, in, the, um, in the literature, but something that I've thought about is high involvement followers. Now, there are certain members of your audience who can develop a very, very deep bond with a franchise. And I would say a lot of our pod podcasters are very, very aware of them. They call them like my core audience or, you know, my, my fans or things like that. But what they are talking about are, they are talking about audience members who have a high degree of interest and attachment to the person. They follow them, they interact with them, whatever. Those people are, can act in the same way that cultural encoding does. They will stick around with a franchise longer. They will try new things that the franchise offers. And sometimes they'll even create derivative content, right? Like if, if I like your show and I tweet about it, uh, or I tweet about every episode, then like I'm encoding your content on my Twitter feed. I'm reminding people. And in a sense, I'm working as a cultural encoding agent for you. And high involvement audiences are very, very important to a lot of producers. They talk about them, they cater to them, they're at the forefront of their mind. Um, this is, a, well, whatever, I'll get it. And then one last, one last thing. Uh, the topic of cancellation uh, 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 comes up once in a while. And cancellation is interesting. Um, so what cancellation is, it's, it, uh, it is a, it's often a, uh, it's a social movement that is trying to encourage people to stop following or boycotting content that features a particular celebrity who is perceived to have transgressed a, you know, uh, some type of moral uh, red line, right? So, uh, for example, uh, so if you take a look on, on the left, these are con conservative people who, uh, you know, in, in conservative circles are said to have been canceled for their uh, opposition to liberal views. And on the right, there's, 
uh, a cartoon about the 1619 project and a question about critical race theory becoming banned. These are two examples of cancellation where somebody is engaged in some method to try to prevent people from consuming products, trying to get people's shows delisted, trying to decode them from the cultural memory, get try to get Aziz and Sari's shows off in Netflix, unfollow his account, whatever, you know. Um, a lot of this is a political discourse. Uh, a lot of people who are being canceled appear to be using it as part of a campaign to hype a new cultural or a new production outlet. And uh, I don't know, it's hard to differentiate the act of being canceled from like the act of hyping a new enterprise because it's a great line to do it. True cancellation, though, is far more difficult today than in the past. It used to be that you could blackball somebody, but now that makes no sense. Uh, I mean, in a world where Nazis can run TV and radio stations, because uh, they can, effectively on YouTube or by running a podcast or running a blog, anybody can run anything. Uh, there's far less regulation than there ever was. And I, I just I just don't believe in this cancellation. But what it is interesting is it shows that they're attacking the basis, the economic basis or the influence base of a person by encouraging people to unfollow them and decode them from the culture. So that is the end of sort of our look at fame. How do you get it? How do you use it? How do you keep it? If you enjoyed this talk, check out an episode from this Monday of my podcast, the Annex Sociology Podcast. It features Carrie O'Ferris, and we talk about celebrity. She's a very accomplished researcher and an expert. She's a very funny woman. Uh, you can get it on iTunes or Spotify, or you can just ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of the Annex Sociology Podcast. If you do this this week or next week, you'll get that episode. And then one more uh, sort of message before we go to Q&A. This is just for the Queen's Podcast Lab series. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Queen's Podcast Lab uh, learning series. These are free educational products or uh, resources rather brought to you by the state and city of New York. These are your tax dollars at work. We create free public resources and non-commercial scholarly media content. And if you'd like to support the work we do, uh, visit our website, queenspodcastlab.com and click donate your tax deductible donation to our project through the uh, Department of Sociology will not only help us, but students.